Yeah, mine was the page eight also. One and then the well, one. No, it is one. Mine and one. So it was only a few pages. And then the rest of it is definitely just separate documents. You want to see? Hmm. So what is the um, Yeah, it's one page one, 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 and then it goes to eight, nine, ten. He said the memo was a two page. It was a two page memo. Oh, I I think there's something else we got printed on the back of it. Mine was only a one page one and page two. You have a front and back there. Yeah. And that's not anything in the way that I think. Okay, it's seven o'clock. We can begin. This meeting is called to order. Roll call. Councilman Anderson. Present. Councilman Perrault. Present. Councilwoman Worthy. Present. Deputy Mayor Whitfield. Present. And Mayor McIntosh. Present. We will now have our prayer by Minister Dwayne Wallace, Associate Minister, Alpha Baptist Church. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I haven't been here in a while. I didn't know quite enough. It, you know, reason, but I would like to remind council and the members of the public why we're here. And the preamble to the Constitution tells us that we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility, that's the job. Just to do your job. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you for times like this when we can come together and do your will and do your work. We pray now for this council, Lord, as they make decisions. Give them divine wisdom, Lord, beyond their education, beyond their experience, beyond their age. Mm -hmm. They might make decisions that are wise for this community. We call it Willingboro, but you call it your, your home. So we ask you to bless them, bless the, the residents here as they come forward, Lord. Allow them to, to be compassionate and recognize that we're all on the same team. We're fighting for the same cause. So, Lord, we love you, we pray you, and we glorify you. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. We will now stand for our flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In compliance with the Open Public Meeting Act, this is to announce that adequate notice of this meeting was provided in the following manner. Advance written notice of this meeting was posted on the bulletin board in the municipal complex and was mailed to the Burlington County Time, the Intellinger, and the Courier Time. Advance written notice of this meeting was filed with the township clerk. The clerk is directed to enter into the minutes of this meeting this public announcement. Mayor. Thank you, Tom. We'll start off with the proclamations. Um, we have autism. This month is Autism Awareness Month and Parkinson's Awareness Month. Council what you want to do. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Proclamation in honor of Autism Awareness Month. Whereas autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral challenges. Autism is the fastest growing developmental disorder. There is often nothing, there's often nothing about how people with ASD look. 
that sets them apart from other people. People with ASD may communicate, interact, behave, and learn in different ways that are different from neurotypical people. The learning, thinking, and problem-solving abilities with people with ASD can range from gifted to severely challenged. And whereas the Center for Disease Control estimates that one in every 68 children in the United States are among the more than 2 million Americans living with autism spectrum disorder. Autism is a reality that affects millions of families every day. And while our nation has made progress in supporting those with ASD, we are only beginning to understand the factors behind the challenges they face. And whereas research shows that early intervention treatment services can improve a child's development, early intervention services can help children from birth to three years old learn important skills. Services can include therapies to help the child talk, walk, interact with others, communicate and control behaviors, including physical aggression and self-injury behavior. And whereas during Autism Awareness Month, we recommit to helping individuals on autism spectrum reach their full potential and have an opportunity to live full independent lives and follow their talents wherever they lead. And whereas during the month of April, we strive to promote autism awareness, inclusion, and self-determination for all, and assure that each person with ASD is provided an opportunity to achieve the highest possible quality of life. And now, therefore, I, Kaya McIntosh, Mayor of the Township of Willingboro, along with the Willingboro Township Council and the Willingboro residents, do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Autism Awareness Month, I encourage all Willingboro residents to learn more about how they can support individuals on the um, autism spectrum and their family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ramon. I also would like to remind everyone that um, Councilwoman Perone is leading um, alter autism awareness. Um, in my shoes, in my shoes. in my shoes spectrum. Uh, spectrum, okay. Yes, Autism in My Shoes uh, Symposium, which will be held April 22nd at the JFK Center at um, beginning at 11 to 3 p.m. No, we appreciate you um, stairheading that. We look forward to participating. Hopefully everyone can come out. Thank you. And just a correction on the proclamation is two, 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, I'm going to read the proclamation in honor of Parkinson's Awareness Month. Whereas Parkinson's disease is a chronic progressive neurological disease and is the second most common neurodegenerative disease in the United States. The Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research is dedicated to finding a cure for Parkinson's disease through an aggressively funded research agenda and to ensuring the development of improved therapy for living for those living with Parkinson's today. Whereas there is an inadequate, inadequate data on the incidence and prevalence of Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease, but it is estimated to affect nearly 1 million people in the United States. And that number is expected to more than double by 2040. Whereas it is estimated that Parkinson's cost $52 billion per year of which the federal government shoulders 29 billion, leaving American families to cover the remaining 29 billion. Whereas there is no known cure or drug to slow or halt the progression of the disease and available treatments are limited in the ability to address patients' medical needs and remain effective over time. The symptoms of Parkinson's disease vary from person to person and can include tremor, slowness of movement and rigidity, gait, and balance difficulty, speech, and swallowing disturbances. Whereas volunteers, researchers, and caregivers, and medical professionals are working to improve the quality of life of people living with Parkinson's disease and their families. 
Whereas the Township of Willingboro, New Jersey, rec recognizes the efforts of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research as it leverages its core values of optimism, urgency, resourcefulness, collaboration, accountability, and persistence in problem solving to work on behalf of the 6 million people worldwide living with Parkinson's. Whereas increased research education and community support services are needed to find more effective treatments and to provide access to quality care to those living with the disease today. Now, therefore, Ikea T. McIntosh, Mayor of Willenborough Township, do hereby proclaim April as Parkinson's Awareness Month in Willingboro. Thank you. I think we have something from... Director Bucks, or do, driving distract, distracting, distracted virus. Okay. Oh, okay. Would you like to read it? <laughs> Proclamation 2023, you text, you drive, you text, you pay. Distracted driving crackdown April 1st through 30th, 2023. <clears throat> Whereas distracted driving is a serious, life threatening practice that is preventable, and whereas distracted driving can result in injuries and deaths to all road users, motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists, and whereas distracted driving occurs when drivers divert their attention away from the task of driving to focus on another activity instead. And whereas from 2011 through 2020, distracted driver related crashes resulted in 32,000 deaths on our nation's roads, our nation's roads. And whereas in New Jersey, distracted driving was listed as a contributing circumstance in 50% of all motor vehicle crashes from 2016 to 2020. And whereas the state of New Jersey will participate in a nationwide distracted driving. 2023 crackdown from April 1st through 30th, 2023, in effect to raise awareness and, and decrease distracted driver distraction through a combination of enforcement and education. And whereas the national slogan for the campaign campaign is you drive, you text, you pay. Yes. And whereas a reduction in distracted driving in New Jersey will save lives on our roadways. Therefore, we have resolved that I, Kay McIntosh, Mayor of Willingboro Township, declares its support for the distracted driver 2023 crackdown both locally and nationally from April 1st through 30th, 2023, and pledges to increase awareness of, dan of the dangers of distracted driving. Thank you, Captain Bucks. Moving on, minute, we'll just proceed with the manager's report. Good evning, Mayor and uh, Willing Barrow. Good evening. Good evening. We will uh, just have a pretty brief report this evening. I'll start off with our communications department. Communications department has prepared and mail communications to every resident uh, regarding the launch of Willing Barrow Connect. The number of downloads so far have been 597 from the Apple Store and 266 from Google Play for Androids. We uh, highly encourage residents to download the apps onto their smart devices and not only download the apps but register as well. The app is an opportunity for residents to report concerns, track progress, and communicate their concerns to the township in a more efficient manner. Um, there is continued uh, participation in discussion regarding this year's Clean Communities and Initiative and plans to keep uh, Willingboro clean. Additionally, promotions have begun for the annual Spring Clean Communities Cleanup, which is scheduled for a Saturday, April 22nd. Residents are encouraged to register for this event. Uh, let's come together to help clean Willingboro clean. And you can register in the Willingboro Connect app or on our website at www.willingboronj.gov and click on the How Do I tab. <laughs> Just a quick update on our finances. Our revenues generated as of March totals one million one forty one five fifty three, uh, eight hundred and seventy one thousand of which was tax revenue, 
and a total of $2,317,093.21 was expended during the month of March. Uh, we have been uh, doing some economic development and I am happy to announce uh, we have some new businesses moving into Willingboro. Starbucks will be constructing a location in the town center. I believe that that will be uh, done and they will be ready to move by 2024. Calibrate Collision has plans to open a location on Route 130 uh, and Veterans Parkway where the old Goodyear is now uh, located. And I'm going to ask Mr. Lowry to report on a new restaurant looking to come in into the township. Mr. Lowry. Good evening, Mayor, members of the governing body. Uh, so I toured uh, 1911 Smokehouse. I, I brought them here, uh, 1911 Smokehouse, this past Monday, or last Monday, was it? Um, and we looked at a couple locations, the same location, the same path site that the uh, Starbucks will be on. And we also went to uh, the snapback location in the um, town center. Um, everything in the town center was in that snapback location was pretty much brand new. He walked in and everything that he needed was pretty much there. He had a really good conversation with the owner of that location. Um, they talked about the numbers. He's pretty interested in coming in. He thought the numbers were favorable um, and he thinks he can get open by July 1st. Um, so he's going to start moving in. He's going to start that process of moving in. His only concern was a liquor license and making sure that that was available. Um, that was something that he wanted to make sure that was available by the time he moved in. Um, so we started looking at certain things that we could do with a liquor license in terms of any, I guess, kind of segmenting it and making up sec exceptions uh, so that could be available in that, you know, in the Willingboro Center instead of just we're talking about things that we could do uh, to make it uh, accessible um, and, and ready. So uh, that is the update on 1911 Smokehouse. <laughs> Should I say it again? <laughs> so the, yeah, that's the snapback location on 130 um, in the Willingboro it Town. Hard. Hardy's, it used to be the Hardy. old Hardy's um, in the Township Center. Next to the Chase Bank. Yeah. Checkers, yeah. Okay, we this it'll be 1911 smokehouse. Campus, campus smokehouse. <laughs> this will actually be their, their third location. They have a location in Trenton. Uh, they just recently opened a location in the Newark Airport. And uh, we reached out to them and said, you know what? Would you be interested in coming down to Willingboro? And, you know, Mr. Laurie arranged the tour. Uh, we found some very favorable property and he was very much excited and planning to come to Willingboro. So we were very excited about that. So right now we would just have to adjust our ordinance or look through the ordinance and see if we will accommodate that for that particular location. That's correct. And I've already had a conversation with the solicitor uh, about the way that liquor licenses get issued and uh, and he and the clerk and, and you will kind of get together and figure out the best way to uh, effectuate this in Willingboro without creating an, an over uh, an, an avalanche of alcohol liquor license requests. So it'll take some, some doing. There are certain exceptions that can be put into place, uh, some wording in the ordinance um, that would limit, but you know, we'll just trust that, that that will be crafted in a way that is beneficial to promote business here in Willingboro without opening the floodgates, you know, more than, than the council desires it to be open. Okay, thank you. So continuing on with my report, fire and EMS, the uh, second Citizens Fire Academy applications are now online. The application deadline is April the 19th. Uh, this free fund academy is to help participants on how the Willingboro Fire Department operates with the goal of learning about fire safety. There is no cost to attend. Participants must be at least 21 years of age and commit to attending uh, seven of the eight classes. There are uh, spaces limited. There are only 15 seats available and the groups meet every Wednesday evening from 6.30 to 9.30 uh, p.m. Uh, the classes will start on April the 26th, run through June 14th, and they will be held at the Willingboro Fire EMS located on Charleston Road. Update on Parks and Recreation. The Phenomenal Women's Award Dinner will be held on Sunday, April the 23rd 
at 3 p.m. in the Kennedy Center Banquet Hall. Tickets are available at $55 and can be purchased online at willingboroughrec.com or in person at the Recreation and Parks window between the hours of 9 and 5, Monday through Friday until April 14th. The following people were nominated and selected for the Phenomenal Women's Award, and we uh, send our congratulations to Dr. Neely A. Hackett for education, uh, Shakira Howard as business and entrepreneurship, Alpha Andrews for advocacy, uh, Reverend Dr. Donetta McCain, the lifetime achievement, Patricia Lindsay Harvey for government, and Viance Torres as a trailblazer. Additionally, there are a few upcoming events in April, which we are encouraging residents to participate in. The Easter egg hunt will be held this Saturday, April 8th at the Kennedy Center baseball field, uh, 10 a.m. for children ages three and four only, and at 10.30 a.m. for children five and six only. This event is rain or shine. There will be an open mic event along with the ribbon cutting ceremony of the amphitheater on April 21st at six o'clock p.m. We encourage everyone to come in and enjoy that. And Earth Day is on Saturday, April 22nd, again from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, we will be hosting events with a couple of organizations uh, in the community, uh, Kennedy Center Community Garden Courtyard. For public safety, the Citizens Police Academy began on Saturday, April 1st. Graduation date is Saturday, April 29th from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, this month, there were 78 violations addressed by this department, um, 41 ordinance violations. There were 21 warnings issued, 10 summonses. So the police are doing their due diligence and cracking down on um, different ordinance violations. There has been an update for a homicide case that occurred back in 2019, where Marvin Coleman Jr., 24, was found guilty on charges of felony murder in the first degree, um, robbery in the first degree, murder in the first degree, possession of weapon for unlawful purposes in the second degree, and unlawful possession of a weapon in the second degree. Uh, and he is scheduled for sentencing on June 29th. Uh, this investigation began after Willingboro police were called to Medley Lane just before 8.30 on March 7, 2019, for a report of a female in a parked car with an apparent gunshot wound. Arriving officers found uh, Maribeli Lopez in the driver's seat of her Ford Focus with the engine still running. And the investigation determined the shooting occurred approximately 11 p.m the night before. So that person has been uh, found guilty and uh, charged on the charges, all those charges listed. As I reported at our last meeting, uh, crime has been on a downward trend in Willingboro. And I did ask Captain Bucks to share with the council and the community very briefly this evening, how the Willingboro Police Department uses data to uh, combat crime in the township. So I'll call back Captain Bucks once again. Have a quick PowerPoint that's going to go along with uh, with my presentation. So, uh, Sean, if you could bring up that uh, that PowerPoint when you get the opportunity. Yes, we got. All right, Dep our mayor, deputy mayor, council, township manager. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you uh, for this opportunity, allowing me to go over uh, some of our some of our accomplishments, some of our statistics. And some of our future plans for uh, you know going into 2020 from 2022 into 2023. Uh, Sean, next slide, please. Some of the things that I'm going to be covering: it's going to be uh, our calls for service, our cases, use of force, our use of force reviews, internal affairs, our uniform crime report, and our future projects such as Axon Bundle and our Shot Spotter. Next slide, please. So calls for service. Calls for service are anything from your typical 911 call to a robbery, theft, uh, and, and homicide. So in 2022, our police department handled over, it was 32,050 calls for service. What I have up here on the slides are the last five years, and it's broken down each month. 
And Sean, if you can go to the next slide, please. And this is some of our larger numbers of our calls for service. So alarms, we handled 1,615 alarms, animal complaints, 1,099. We assisted our EMS on 3,894 EMS calls. We handled 545 disputes, 777 domestics, our escorts, 615. An escort would be anything from where we would assist another, uh, another municipality or another agency uh, and escorting them to another residence such as DCPMP, outreach, something like that. Another uh, example of that would be, uh, let's say someone had a temporary restraining order and they wanted to go back to that location to get some of their belongings. That would, is what an escort is. Missing persons, 336 missing persons. Again, those are calls for service where someone may report that that person is missing. We get there, you know, we do our due diligence and maybe the next 30 minutes that person is found. So that's just listed as a cause for service. And I'll get into what cases are next. So motor vehicle accidents, 796 motor vehicle accidents, noise complaints, it's blocked, uh, thefts, uh, 325. Property checks, I think are somewhere around 3,000-ish and that's blocked also. So our property checks or anytime our officers go in, do a property check, such as in any of our parks or our businesses, they'll call that out and list it as a property check. And we've done in excess over, uh, over 3,000 property checks. Suspicious activity is just that. Uh, thefts, traffic stop, we've conducted 4,344 traffic stops in 2022, and well-being checks are 947. And these, these, these categories here are a small number of about 60, but they're some of the larger numbers that we respond to on, on a regular basis. Next slide, please. And this is just a breakdown over the 12 months, and you can kind of see which months are our busier months, which months are our quote unquote slower months. We average somewhere between 2,600 to 2,700 calls for service a month. Next slide, please. Now we move on to our cases. What a case is, it's an incident, which I just talked about, turns into something more. There's more of an investigation. So we had a total of 2,455. An example of where a incident would turn into a case would be somewhere, let's say a, a parking complaint. If someone calls us and says, hey, there's a car parked facing the wrong direction or it's blocking my driveway, we respond there, we go out with that vehicle and let's say we get their, their driver's license, we check their information and now that person has a, a warrant for their arrest. That's where it goes from an incident into a case. Another example could be, um, let's say, if it's a dispute call, we get we get called to a, a residence for a, a dispute or a uh, or a loud noise or something like that. And as we get there, our investigation leads into something a little bit more. Let's say it's a uh, like a domestic, the husband, wife, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, brother are now in a physical altercation. Now that turns into an incident and into a case. Next slide, please. And again, out of those 60-ish incidents, they're the same thing for cases. And these are just some of the higher number cases that we've handled for 2022. So you can see 126 assaults, 101 burglaries, 819 domestics. The previous slide was 707, 777 domestics, and this is 819. And the reason the discrepancy is, is because how it's dispatched to us. We could get dispatched for, like I said, a noise complaint. Well, that's what it was dispatched as. Now it becomes a domestic because that's what it's categories, categorized as. And domestic is kind of, it, it's kind of, it, it's a bigger picture of things. Most people typically think of, you know, a relationship, but it's also household members. So if me and Mr. Harris were roommates. We get into an we get into, we get into an, an altercation. He got stinky feet. <laughs> That would be considered under New Jersey law, that would be considered a domestic. It doesn't have to be some type of, of, of relationship. Uh, same thing with bro brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers. Um, frauds, we have 74 frauds, 199 um, harassments, 81 missing persons. You see that that number is significantly lower. What happens is that one involves a lot more investigation, you know, where maybe that person, you know, uh, it, it took us longer to find that person. 
uh, vehicle thefts are 47 and theft slash larceny are 293. Next slide, please. This is next slide is going to be per month. Like we like I did the breakdown over uh, calls for service. We average about 204, 205 cases per month for 2022. Next slide, sir. So what I did now is I broke down our use of force. So out of those 32,050 calls, we had 51 situations where our officers had to use force. So with the use of force, that situation is one situation. You'll see that there's 115 reports. How it works for us is any officer that uses force has to complete that report. So that's why you see there's 51 situations, but there may be one situation where two or three officers had to use force. So that's why you see the reports are higher than the situations because each officer has to do their own report and for each force that, you know, for the force that they, that they used. So when I compared those numbers to the numbers of last year, it was a 12% um, decrease. And the number right above that is the 0.15%. That is a 0.15% anytime an, a, a police officer responds to a call for service that the possibility that force would be used. So it's, it's a very, very, very small amount um, where force would be used by one of our officers. The graph to the right, that's a five-year five year, uh, breakdown of the type of use of force that's used. And you can't see it now, but it's, it's going to be, uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's hand control. And um, Captain Bucks, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can we ask Sean just to move that box, um, the Zoom box, so that we can see the data that's up there? If you can put it on the line or. Yeah, if you can minimize that Zoom box. All right, sorry, um, Captain Bucks. While he's working on that, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you can go ahead and good breakdown. So the five year the five year breakdown basically shows that our officers their use of force is going to be some type of control, some type of control technique. If we can go to the next slide, if you would like me to continue. Yeah. Do you remember what that largest section is? The, the red or three percent? The blue. The blue was okay. was some type of hand control. Oh, okay. So then what I decided to do is, so I decided to take down however, how many arrests we had in 2022, and then determine how many use of forces that we used in 2022. So in 2022, we had 460 arrests. Out of those 460 arrests, only 24 times our officers had to use force during that arrest. And that's a five- 0.2% chance that force was necessary or needed during those encounters. So if you go back a couple slides, we had 51 situations. So 24 of them were during, were during an arrest. And the total was 460 arrests. Next slide, please. The reasons why force is being used overall. So 71% the subject resisted arrest or officer control. So what that means was is, you know, and statistics say that most times if someone's going to, uh, if a person's going to resist a police officer, it's when that first handcuff goes on. And that's kind of what our statistics show too, is that 71% of the time is, that's what the, um, that's what that, uh, that, that data showed. Yeah, if he could, uh, enlarge that. Go back a couple slides, Sean. Right with the, um, one more. So compliance hold. So if you look at it, it was 58.7 was a compliance hold. And then the next number was 28.1 was our officers used, you know, hands or feet, which would be some type of, uh, some type of strike 
or something like that. Uh, typically what would happen if a, a strike might be used is if someone's laying on the ground and their hands are here and you can't get their, uh, they can't get their hands out, you're trying to pull it, you could use a distraction technique or distraction strike to, you know, their common peroneal or something like that to be able to put that person into, uh, into handcuffs. So, but you can see, you know, most of our, most of our use of forces are compliance holds or they were wrestled to the ground. Next slide. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is in that other category? It was 13.3%. I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not 100% sure because that, that data comes from our benchmark that's governed by the uh, attorney general. So there's a list of categories that's on there. So if there was something that wasn't on there, it would have been listed as, as other. I can get you that information. That's easy to get. Okay. Great. Thank you. Next slide. Next one. So after that 71%, the next uh, the next uh, reason why force was being used was 22% was for pushing or shoving. Next slide, please. Injuries. So during those 51 use of force incidents that I talked about, there was a total of 25 injuries. 10 injuries were to the sus suspects and 15 injuries were to our officers. And the most common injury were abrasions, lacerations, basically cuts, scrapes, and uh, things of that nature. Next slide. Since we talked about use of force, I wanted to go over what our policies are and our procedures are as any time that force is used by one of our officers. At a minimum, it's reviewed three times. It's reviewed by their direct supervisor, after it's reviewed by their direct supervisor, it goes up to their watch commander, which would be their lieutenant. Then after it's reviewed by their lieutenant, it goes to the internal affairs lieutenant. And at each step, the frontline supervisor, the lieutenant or internal affairs lieutenant has the ability to determine whether there is an, there is an issue. And some of the deficient, if there's a deficiency, uh, our officers are held accountable, they're disciplined accordingly. Some of the discipline range from a counseling notice training, suspensions, dis and dismissals. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about internal affairs. So during a use of force review, each one at each one of those levels, we have the ability to open up an internal affairs investigation as we're watching or we're reviewing that use of force. So if we're reviewing a use of force or reviewing any type of body camera footage and we re each of our sergeants are required by policy to review a certain amount of body cam footages per month, if they see some type of rule infraction, they have to address it then. And if it goes into, you know, it goes into a, a major rule infraction, infraction, then an internal affairs investigation will be opened up and that'll get turned over to an internal affairs and a formal investigation will be completed. So if you look at the numbers here for 2022, we had excessive force. There is a report of five excessive force internal affairs complaints. There is a total, uh, there is two for improper arrest, two for improper entry, two for improper search, one for a differential treatment, six for demeanor complaints, and 17 for other rule violations for a total of 35 internal affairs uh, investigations for the entire year. Next slide, please. So now this one is going to be the disposition of those internal affairs complaints. So there's, there's four different categories. There's sustained, exonerated, not sustained, and unfounded. So in 2022, there was 11 sustained complaints, which means that the member violated some type of agency rule or regulation and they were disciplined accordingly. Exonerated means that the alleged conduct did occur, but they didn't violate our rules or regulations. And then unfound or sustained means that there was insufficient evidence to decide whether that alleged misconduct occurred. And then unfounded is that the evidence shows that there's, there wasn't alleged misconduct that did not occur. Next slide, please. This is our street crimes, an overview of what our street crimes officers did for the year in 2022, actually the five years. But if you pay attention to uh, 2022, and this is just our street crimes unit, this isn't the entire patrol division, 
they seized 13 firearms. They seized 400 uh, or 4,400 grams of marijuana, 159 grams of cocaine, one gram of heroin, heroin, 113 grams of meth, one gram of MDMA, and seven grams of the magic mushrooms. Next slide. The other one below is uh, you can't see, but it was uh, prescription pills. So now the Uniform Crime Report. With the Uniform Crime Report, that's reported to the federal federal government and the state government, and it's broken down into seven different categories. You have violent crimes and nonviolent crimes. So if you look at the top four: murder, rape, robbery, and assault. Then you have the bottom three: burglary, larceny, and auto theft. Larceny, New Jersey, we don't have a larceny; it's theft or fraud. But since it's for the you know for the entire United States, they categorize it as larceny, and that's what those numbers are. So every time we have a a, 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 re, a report, it's scored a certain way, and those numbers are submitted into submitted into the uh, the feds and the state, and then there's a, there's a there's a finalized number. So you can see there's a difference between 2021 and 2022, and the big difference was in our larceny. So with the larceny, what they started to count in larceny between 2021 and 22 is fraud started to be counted into that larceny category. So that's why you see that slight increase between 2021 and 2022. But overall, I went back as far as 2014, 2015, where our numbers were in the 800s and 900s. So every year for the last five, six, seven years, our, our uniform crime report numbers have continued to drop. And... I urge you guys to go onto uh, the website and look at other municipalities and compare them to Willingboro, where we look pretty good. We look really good. Next slide, please. So we also attended over 140 community events and our officers raised over 13,000 and uh, for various charitable organizations. Next slide. That's a handsome Santa Claus up there, too. <laughs> yeah. So in 2022, we had three, three retirements and we had two resignations. Next slide. And we also had five promotions in 2022 of various ranks throughout the, uh, throughout the organization. Next slide. So future plans. So we want to continue to improve our service to our residents and hold our hold our officers to an even higher standard. So one of the things that we're looking into and that we're that we're going to uh, request in our capital budget is the Axon Bundle. The Axon Bundle is it's a all in one platform that encompasses our body worn cameras, our in car cameras, our tasers, and our uh, our interview room. And there's additional software that's that's included. So what's, what's beneficial with the bundle is our in-car cameras and body-worn cameras will now be on the same platform. Currently, they're on different platforms, and they don't talk to each other. So the benefit of that is if I, if I pull up to a car stop and my body-worn camera isn't on, as soon as I pull up to the car stop, it's called Axon Signal, it's automatically going to turn my body camera on. And then when you go back and you review the body-worn camera footage, you have everything there. You have the, the in-car camera footage that syncs up to the body-worn camera footage, and it's all in one entire platform. And then the second one is, so I took our numbers for fireworks and gunshots. For that we got called for uh, in in 2022, and combined it was a total of 129. The issue that we run into is: is it a gun call or is it a fireworks call? So one of the things we decided to do is we decided to apply for a grant for uh, for Shot Spotter, and we were actually given the grant, and the the award letter hasn't come out, but we won the grant for 99 99,000 dollars, which is going to allow us to purchase the shot spotter software and technology. What that does, it's going to have microphones strategically placed throughout the municipality. And once, if it hears sound that reaches a certain decibel level, it's going to triangulate that. And it's going to give us a report back within 60 seconds of that particular location. 
which is beneficial because there's times where we won't get any calls until someone shows up to the hospital with a gunshot wound. And then we're trying to backtrack, you know, where did this happen? How long ago did it happen? Did it happen, even happen in Willingboro? So if we have this technology that's going to be able to, you know, potentially could potentially save somebody's life also, because if we can respond there and get that notification within 60 seconds, that means there's a quicker response by police and EMS, which potentially can save somebody's somebody's life. So that's uh, that's things that are on our on our horizon. And then the last to wrap this whole thing up. Next slide, please. Is our continued mission, you know, is to continue to build on the foundation of our predecessors and always look for ways to improve, you know, continue to improve the quality of life in Willingboro through our partnerships and to continue the outstanding relationship that our police department has with our community. So I thank you guys again for your time and any questions. Thank you, Captain. Are there any questions for Captain Bucks for this um, presentation? I did. Have. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for your presentation. I think the transparency um, with the community is so incredibly important, um, especially in these times that we're in. And it's uh, refreshing to see the Willingboro Police Department um, take take on the challenge to improve police relations and increase transparency with the community. So kudos and thank you to you and the department for that. Um, I had one question about the shot spotter. Yeah. Um, can it differentiate the difference between fireworks and gunshots? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Awesome. And hopefully at the next council meeting or the meeting after we have a representative from shot spotter that would come in and give a presentation to all of the the capabilities that it would have and it would be able to ask you know you would be able to ask any question any and all questions you know to that representative okay all right and then one last question um in the total calls for service numbers that you gave are the cases included in those numbers yes okay that was it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Captain Box? Wait, wait. <laughs> just to count. <laughs> Thank you. Public comment. Yeah. You can. We'll. You can do that. Public comment, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, I have a question. I have do have a question. I know. I'm. I'm so happy that we received the ninety-nine thousand dollar grant. That's huge. Um, but what are your future anticipated costs? for this particular, I think it's a great system. I just want to, yes. you know, so be able to as of right now, it's, it's 49,500 per year. So what's, what I like about it is that we have it free for two years. And then if it's not working to its capabilities, we're not locked in. We could, we could research and try different avenues, but at this point, after that, after the two year period, it's 49,000, 49,500. All right. Per, per year. Per year. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, but we'll get a report back on how it's working. Yes, ma'am. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. You're All right, Mr. Harris. Thank you Good. so much. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> yes, um, you know, I think it's important that, you know, what our departments do in Willingboro, um, you know, you get properly educated and the community gets properly educated on some of the details and information that you may not be privy to. And I just thought it was important for Captain Bucks. It's one thing for me to say crime is going down, but it's another thing for him to come and show what these crimes are and why they're going down and what his people are doing, not only to police the community, but police themselves as well. So I, I won't promise that I'll have a presentation every meeting, but you know, as things arise that I feel is worthy for you and the community to be brought up to speed on, I will absolutely bring them before your presence. Thank you. So to continue on with my report, Public Works, uh, this department has been busy throughout the municipality with various repairs of uh, the Catch Basin structural repair on Win Windover Lane, Clubhouse Drive, Winterberry Lane, Windsor Lane. Uh, these all locations are 85% complete. Uh, pothole repair is still ongoing. Gaffney Lane has been completed. Uh, the street signs on MLK Drive have been replaced. Litter Patrol has continued throughout the month of March. And uh, DPW has also begun a brush trimming on Van Skyver and Veterans Parkway to prepare for the grass cutting season 
and Willingboro residents will see the lower boxes along Veterans Parkway and Beverly Rancocas Road being planted over the next few weeks with flowers. Um, <laughs> told you. Yeah. You know, on, on Saturday evening, we had a very serious storm that came through Willingboro. Um, through that storm, we experienced only one outage in the community and uh, no major events. And I firmly believe that is because of works, uh, public work that public work has been doing with uh, PSC&G and trimming and removing some of these trees that has mitigated some of those issues on behalf of the township. And I, I, I believe that the results were demonstrated on Saturday evening. So we are continuing to continue um, these projects to, you know, make Willingboro just the best that it can be. Um, just so you know, the uh, Bolton and Balfour Lane repairs are fully completed. Uh, those projects came in under budget. I don't have the final certificate payment uh, number as of yet, but when it is received, I will share the final cost with the township. Um, just so you're aware, also we are receiving our third allotment from the National Opioid Settlement. To date, we will have received over 45,000 for opioid education and uh, community service efforts. We're looking to uh, at different options to utilize those revenues ranging from educational programs in conjunction with the schools and also potentially distributing uh, drug activation systems. So we do have to determine what we are going to start utilizing that money and put it into some type of program. Uh, the DCA has elevated our grant application for the $1 million allocated in this year's state budget for Willingboro. Uh, it has been moved onto the contract phase. So those monies will be allocated to the Performing Arts Center and should be on their way relatively soon. Uh, in relation to that, on April the 18th, we will be hosting a walkthrough of the theater space so residents can see some of the elements associated with that project. In conjunction with that, the council meeting will be held at the JFK Center on April the 18th to allow residents to preview the new theater space, um, see some of the design elements. Um, there will be a, a, a brief video of what that theater will look like, and we'll have the opportunity to ask any questions about the space and the design. The phase one bid for that project is going out next week. It will be out for about four weeks, and then we will know what the actual costs are to begin construction on phase one. So I suspect that they will be back in May. Um, and we could probably award that towards the end of May and begin construction uh, sometime after that for the, the theater. Uh, we also received confirmation today uh, through the iBank that the iBank has approved the allocation in the amount of $3,586,000 to Willingboro for the 2024 road repair project that I had been speaking on. Uh, we would be required to have that project designed, bid, and Construction started by March 31st of 2024. It is not a complete commitment until you know you decide, yes, we are actually going to go through, but they have reviewed our project and said, yes, we would fund this project. So um, I will be looking for the paperwork from them and then uh, which will detail a little bit more what we have to do as the township to move forward in that process. So that's all that I really wanted to bring to you for this evening. Um, is there any question? Does anybody have any questions, council, <laughs> for... Um, uh, yeah, council just like I said, I just want to be mindful that as we do this project, you know, based on our ordinance, we do have a PLA in place. Okay, so I just want to make sure, you know, there's something council voted on that project labor agreement with the unions. So just be mindful. Yes. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Harris's update? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris, for your report. Um, a question about the opioid money that we received. Yes. Can any of that be used towards, I don't know what the program is called now, but it used to be the D.A.R.E. program. Can it, I know they do education about um, substances and things like that in the schools. 
And can any of that money be used for that program? It can be used for something similar to that. I don't know if it can be allocated specifically to the DARE program, but I do believe that it does provide for some type of in-school education on um, opioid and, and drug use and prevention. Okay, great. Um, and then the other question or I think thing that I just wanted to point out is April 22nd is a very hot day for Willing. Very hot day for Willing. Uh, <laughs> we have the community cleanup at 9 a.m., the uh, autism in my shoes at 11 a.m., and then also the garden uh, opening and Earth Day events at 10 a.m. So those are stacked right on top of each other. Um, just wanted to bring point that out so that we can try to be a little more mindful of um, how we're stacking events and give the community an opportunity to attend all of the wonderful things that we do here in town. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Mr. Harris, you can... So we will continue on with our ordinances and resolutions for the evening. Um, ordinance number 2023-6 is the public hearing and reading uh, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriations limit and establish a cap bank. Um, as you know that um, we are required by law to cap our budget appropriations at 2.5%. However, the law does permit that in certain cases you can exceed that um, a limit and take the excess that has not been used and put it in a reserve bank type situation. Willingboro has not utilized the CAT bank uh, for quite some time, but yet it is something favorable uh, looked upon by our lending institutions when we go and do bonding. So they do look uh, for us to at least have this in place, even though we do not utilize it. Uh, ordinance number 2023-7 is the first reading. Ordinance amending chapter 199 housing standards and chapter 280 rental property of the code of the township of Willingboro. We discussed this uh, a few meetings ago where um, if there is an instance where a homeowner has to have a certificate of occupancy outside of the normal window, um, this puts into place um, that if the inspection must be scheduled at least 15 calendar days prior to request for expedited ex inspections receive four calendar days or less prior to settlement date will require an additional fee of $80. So that's what that particular ordinance relates to. Ordinance number 2023-8 is an ordinance of the township establishing a mutual aid agreement for emergency police services among and between the township of Willingboro and the city of Burlington, uh, Burlington City. Uh, that was what was discussed a few weeks ago, also regarding the agreement for SWAT uh, shared services between uh, Willingboro and Burlington City. So we're going to ask that that first reading uh, move forward. Um, in addition to that is ordinance number 2023-9, which is amending part two, chapter 328, article four, section 328-9 to modify the criteria and process for honorary uh, street name designation. The resolution is being presented for your consideration is resolution number 2023-78. This is resolution approving change order number two and final uh, for the project closeout for the Willingboro Town Center Amphitheater project and accepting the maintenance bond. That theater is, is complete. Um, the final inspections have been done. We are um, requesting that the final change order be paid and accept the maintenance bond for that project, which will be held uh, for two years. I be believe it's dated in October of, of 2022. Uh, resolution number 2023-79 is a authorizing refunds of overpayments of taxes. Uh, we are very familiar with that because it's kind of routine here in Willingboro. Resolution number 2023-80 is a resolution to cancel taxes for 2022 for exempt properties. Um, including disabled residents. That particular resolution is needed to approve, uh, it needs approval to send uh, the resolution to the county 
for us to receive a portion of the exemptions back from the county. So that's why we need to pass that particular resolution. Uh, resolution number 2023-81 is awarding a fair and open contract for professional engineering services to conduct a feasibility study of the costs and benefits of creating a stormwater management utility in Willingboro Township. We were awarded a grant for this um, back in 2022. We put this out to bid um, or an RFP. Um, the engineers did not respond to the RFP for, for their reasons, um, except for one, Pannoni did respond. Um, their bid came in higher than what the grant amount was allocated for. They gave us 30. The RFP came in at 50. We did go back and speak to the grantor who agreed to increase the grant to cover the cost to Pannoni. So this is actually awarding the contract for Pannoni to do the work. We have already received the money from the grantee. So it is at no cost additionally to Willingboro. Uh, resolution number 2023-82 is approving the final closeout for the 2021 concrete repair project and accepting the maintenance bond. This is very similar for the 2021 concrete work that was done on, I believe it was Sunset. Yeah. So that project yeah, is also complete and we did receive the maintenance bond for that as well. Resolution number 2023-83, is a resolution of uh, providing for appointments to various townships uh, boards. And I believe that maybe Ms. Blodgen will go into that a little bit in more detail. And finally, resolution number 2023-84 is a resolution covering the cost of mailing for electronic tax sales. So when a property goes up for tax sale, we are required by, uh, by law to advertise that property. Um, Newspaper publications can be very expensive and tax sales lists can be quite lengthy and quite costly. So this particular legislation uh, allows us to charge the cost for the advertising to the, um, the tax sale E and uh, that's what this resolution is for. So these are all of the things that we are presenting to you this evening for your consideration. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up public comments for agenda items only. If you have any questions or comments for agenda items, you have two minutes. Please state your name. Two minutes. Public comment is now open. Good evening, Council Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and um, fellow residents. You might just speak a oh. little louder if you can. It's on. It's, it's on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pat Lindsay Harvey, Hadley Lang. Um, ordinance 2023-9. Uh, I noticed that uh, 2A and 2C both have years associated with them, but uh, B does not. So I was wondering why B does not, since the other two do. Um, ordinance 2023-78. Uh, it's nice to see that amphitheater is going to be back up in, and being used, but I, I thought it was going to be a little bit fancier than it was, but maybe, you know, with maybe a cover on it or something, but at least it's going to be able to be used. And resolution 2023-81, I'm glad to see we're finally going to do this feasibility study, and it's going to have the help of the Environmental Commission um, to get this done. Thank you. That's all. Good evening, Council. Um, Jacqueline Mack from the Maplewood Lane. I have a question concerning rental properties. How often are they inspected? Um, I'm sure they can turn that on. And how many rental properties are there in Willingboro? I think we have 11,000 some homes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? And then how many exempt properties do we have? Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Ms. I know we're high in other things like uh, <laughs> years of 
few years ago, we had 42% of all the foster children in Burlington County. Mm -hmm. and, grow. and there's nothing you can do with that. It's not, you know, just the way it is. But I was just interested. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Miss Mack. Any public comment online? Um, yes, Mayor Sharon Anderson. Okay. Good evening, folks. Sharon Anderson, 7 Bellhurst Lane, Willingboro. Um, I'm not sure if the manager's report is what we talk about in this comments on agenda, but um, just a real quick comment that that police report was fantastic. And I hope that we can get it out on YouTube to spread further than just the full council meeting or Facebook pages, because there's been a lot of talk on next door uh, with the new owners. Uh, about our police coverage. And um, I just think that meeting was great and should get out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Is there anyone else on Zoom for public comment for agenda items? Um, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, public yeah, one, uh, Maddie Mallory. Okay. Good evening, Maddie Mallory in Hudson Place. Uh, in regards to resolution 2023-80, uh, the word cancellation is misspelled in the last column. And that's my comment for that. Thank you, Ms. Mallory. You're welcome. All right. If there's no one else on Zoom, anyone else in public? All right, public comment for agenda items is now closed. Mr. Collins, do you have a have entered for Ms. Matt? So how many uh, rental properties all right, Mr. Tunselari, do you have that number? Okay. 1,100 rental properties in, in Willingboro, so about 10%. Now, as far as the number of exempt properties, there are a total of 616 exempt properties in Willingboro. 17 of them are schools. Um, there is one other school. Uh, 141 of those are public property. Um, 89 of those are classified as charitable organizations, which would be churches and things of that nature. Um, and then 368 miscellaneous, which would be the veterans exemptions and the seniors exemptions, those would be classified under that 368. So that's the no total of exemptions, totaling $376,458,800 in tax revenue. That's a lot of money. That need to be answered from the agenda. Madam Mayor, perhaps I can clarify in terms of the ordinance uh, 2023 9. The question was why didn't subsection B right, include a time frame? And when this was last discussed with the council as a whole, I believe that this is the exemption there, the app that applies to people that have made significant contributions in art, entertainment, sports, who have attained statewide, national, or international prominence. I think the idea was that you know, there might be somebody, for example, we had talked about the Olympian who won't, I don't think you can ever quantify somebody as having 16 years of whatever, you know, contribution based on that. So the idea was that that would not have a time frame that specific category. So that's the, <clears throat> they believe that's the answer to that question. Thank you, Mr. Crow. Okay, go ahead, Councilman Anderson. Also, um, as I'm looking over it, Section C, um, it was suggested we remove 16 years for military at the last uh, meeting. 
just wasn't changed on here on this revised. Okay, so we we could amend that correct when we do the vote tonight yeah. and delete the reference to sixteen for that subsection C also. Okay. Anything else? All right, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2023-6, this is public hearing, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. Public hearing is now open. Post anyone online? Not at this moment. Public hearing is now closed. This is the final reading for Ordinance 2023-6, Ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. I need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Dr. Worthy, second about Councilman Anderson. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson. Yes. Councilwoman Perone. Yes. Councilwoman Worthy. Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield. Yes. And Mayor McIntyre. Yes. This is the first reading for Ordinance 2023-7, an ordinance amending Chapter 199, Housing Standards, and Chapter 280, Rental Property of the Code of the Township of Willenburg. I need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Dr. Worthy, seconded by Councilman Anderson. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson. Yes. Councilwoman Perone. Yes. Councilwoman Worthy. Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield. Yes. And Mayor McIntosh. Yes. This is the first reading for Ordinance 2023-8, an ordinance of the Township of Willenboro and the City of Burling Burlington to establish a mutual aid agreement for the emergency police services among and between the Township of Willenboro and the City of Burlington. I need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Anderson, seconded by Dr. Worthy. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntyre? Yes. This is the first reading for Ordinance 2023-9, Ordinance Amending Part 2, Chapter 328, Article 4, Section 328-29 of the Willenboro Township Ordinance to modify the criteria and process for honorary street name designation. I need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Anderson, seconded by Dr. Worthy. Any discussion? The discussion. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that was, that was me. <laughs> um, uh, as we indicated on Part C of, of that uh, ordinance, we want like to remove 16 years for those in military service. Any other discussion? Okay, so we can take a roll call on the amended version of the ordinance. Wasn't there one more? You said something about sub DOC. That was just a clarification. We're not changing anything in regard to that. The only change is the one recommended by the councilman. So the change is with the amendment. Roll call is what you're asking, right? Okay. Right. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone. No. Councilwoman Worthy. Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield. Yes. And Mayor McIntosh. Yes. Resolution 2023-78, resolution approving change order number two and final project closeout for the Willenboro Town Center amphitheater, amphitheater project and accepting- Point of order. Um, I'm just gonna do a consent agenda. Okay. I'd like to make a motion for consent agenda resolution 2023-78 through 2023-84. Second. Moved by Mayor McIntosh, seconded by Councilwoman Perone. Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntosh? Yes. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Deputy Mayor Whitfield, seconded by Dr. Worthy. 
Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perron? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. Mayor McIntosh? Yes. We proceed, Madam Clerk. I need approval <laughs> for a treasury report, please. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Councilwoman Worthy, seconded by Councilwoman Perone. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntyre? Yes. I need a motion for approval of minutes for March the 21st, 2023, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Deputy Mayor Whitfield, seconded by Councilwoman Worthy. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Abstain. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntosh? Yes. All right, Madam Clerk. Mayor, mm -hmm. just a few things for update. I will have a uh, municipal clerk update at the next meeting, but um, got a call from the alcohol beverage control, and I believe in your packet, um, you had copies of these resolutions, but we need to resend resolution 2022-97 for um, Boston Military Large number 67. Um, sir solicitor, I'm not sure. Um, how are we supposed to rescind this? So, well, you would generally just you have to do a resolution, and you know we'll we'll work with you on the language for that. But you do a resolution rescinding it. <clears throat> are we going to be entering a replacement resolution for that? Uh, not right now, no. Okay, <clears throat> so we can just put that on for next meeting. Well, I have to have that tonight, and it oh. has to go to alcohol beverage control tomorrow. Okay, well then we'll have to do an oral, an oral motion that we'll have to follow up with and reduce it to writing. So, yes. the motion would be to rescind resolution twenty twenty two dash ninety seven. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So you need a motion, second, and then a vote on that. So, um, can I just give that the next resolution number? That'd be fine. So that would be 2023 85. 86. 86. Mm -hmm. 85 always goes through. The next one goes to executive session. Okay. We won't gotcha. need it, but... um, so resolution 2023 86, uh, resolution rescinding resolution 2022 97. I need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Anderson, seconded by Councilwoman Worthy. Any discussion? Yep. Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntosh? Yes. And also um, a revision to resolution 2021-177. Um, the revision is what they're um, asking to rescind is um, changing Foster Military Lodge to the name that um, we had, I think it was Foster Military Lodge, number 67, and it had to read what its license is, which is Foster Military Lodge Temp Association, Inc., or Temp Association is what's on their license. Um, Point of order, can, Ms. Bajani, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So, resolution 2021-177. Um, passed back in 21, it was passed under uh, Foster Military Lodge number 67, but the name needs to be changed to the name that they got the license under, which is Foster Military Lodge Temp Association. Um, so they asked to change that. And the second paragraph, um, whereas the New Jersey Division of Alcohol Beverage Control has issued a special ruling which grants relief pursuant to NJSA dated September 24th, 2021 for renewal of liquor license for 2021-22 license term and township council concurs with the New Jersey Division of ABC ruling. They just wanted that um, 1218 um, added in that paragraph. 
And so again, sir, solicitor, um, the revision of this resolution for 2021, that has to be a new resolution as well? Yes. <clears throat> just to be clear, they're just talking about it. Not, it's not a complete repeal. It's just a revision of the specific section. Of the yes, administrative. Mm -hmm. So we do need a motion for that revision. So 2023-87, um, a resolution um, revising resolution 2021-177 to change the name and uh, the special rule in 1218 to, um, to that resolution. Need a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Anderson, seconded by Councilwoman Worthy. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perone? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntosh? Yes. Um, and Mayor, we do have to have those signed um, tomorrow and sent to them by noon. Um, also, Mayor and Council, um, I need to know what we want to do with the movement, if anything, on the e-code um, with them updating our ordinances, um, contracting them, and also financial disclosure. Financial disclosures are due April 30th. Um, the filing um, has not yet been opened, but you have to keep going out there to um, to check but it's still due by April 30th. And my last thing is cannabis reopening. What are we doing with the license and when do we plan to open up for the rest? And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And the reopening would be for cannabis um, cultivation. Cultivation, manufacture, and one other. It was retail. Hmm. Other retail. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll get back to you on that one. Okay. And the e code, can you explain um, what we're looking at for that portion? Um, I'm not quite sure all that they do other than. Update when you had asked that our ordinances um, be updated, and that's what they do, and make sure that it is um, in compliance with the state and federal rules and not duplicated um, material in our ordinance as stand. And what was the cost of that? I don't have that in front of me. Madam Mayor, yes, I was wondering if um, if we do go forward with this e code review, would it be a good idea also to perhaps um, work with council or special counsel to do a comprehensive ordinance review for the township and maybe look at it um, based on what recommendations the departments may have um, areas that may need to be revised um, and. I think it's important to do the e-code piece of it, mm -hmm. but if there are areas of our of our ordinance that need to be reconsidered, just revisited, some things may be dated. I know chapter 12 with boards and commissions is something that definitely needs to be looked at. Um, perhaps there is a ad hoc committee of sorts with um, departments, um, you know, a, a council member to an administration can work together. Um, but I think it's a good idea to work with ECODE, but I think we also need to look at the actual meat of the, the ordinance that we have on the books. No, I agree. I agree with that. Um, and Mr. Harris, if you can um, just jump in also, um, are the director, are the different departments looking through their ordinance or ordinances that are applicable to them just to make sure we're staying updated also? Yes, um, some more than others, um, but I would agree with, with Dr. Worthy. Mm -hmm. I think the actual code book in itself needs to, to be a chapter by chapter review. What, e what the E code will do is it will review your ordinances that are in place. They will make sure they are not conflicting with any state statutes, which may have changed over the years. Um, you know, as we introduce ordinances, we add <laughs> language 
into an ordinance that may be in conflict with the language in another ordinance. So they will review things like that and make recommendations based on those things that they find. What they will not do is go and see, well, if your organizational structure is, is what it actually is in the township. So, you know, things like that we need to go through and, and review for an example. Uh, you know, in our administration, you have a department of uh, a department of law where you have a law director and attorneys. Well, we don't have a department of law yet. Our code says that we do. So it's those things that I think a departmental uh, in conjunction with the with the council, the directors, um, the legal department to go through and look at the book chapter by chapter to make recommendation changes. In addition, with the e-code review. I think you could get a pretty comprehensive updated township code. And in your in your experience, you worked with eCode in previous yes. Years. How did, what's the process? And how and how long does it take to go through, you know? They will take our code book and I believe they have it electronically anyway, and they just do whatever whatever they do. Um, depending on the size of your book. Right. Uh, how often it gets codified, you know, things like that. It depends on would really determine um, how long it, right. it takes. So I think our, our book was codified last in, in 2021. So really you're just, the ordinances from 2022 would need to be incorporated and they could do it. I don't, I don't know exactly, but it shouldn't be a, an overly taxing process. Okay. I'm interested in doing it. Um, forming an ad hoc committee to go through um, the ordinance and make sure they're updated. I think it's overdue and we we need to, you know, get on it. It seems a little tedious, but I think, you know. Well worth it. Yeah. Madam Mayor, yes. um, how often should we do this process? And whatever that turns out to be, I think we need to put it in writing that the process is done every so often. Mm -hmm. This way, it just doesn't have to come up by accident. With some other clients that I've represented, uh, they've and done it anywhere from every two years to every five years. Okay. Yeah, if we can just put something in writing, this way we have a policy to follow. So this way it's automatic. Okay. All right. That's <clears throat> and I have been involved in this process, working with ECODE and other municipalities and I'm familiar with it, and I think it does work and makes sense to do it that way if you were so inclined. Okay. So Dr. Worthy and I agree that we should have an ad hoc. Ad hoc. Are there any other inputs yeah, I'm from in support. Council? I'm in support okay. of that. I'm in support of that as well. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm in support of it. Okay. All right. Let's start that. All right. Anything else? E-code, we're good for right now? Yes. Okay. Um. And then also, Mayor, um, the plan endorsement, we did that um, resolution some time ago, but we need to, I guess, set up this committee. Um, and I think there was a portion in there that um, was supposed to be added for the manager's um, office. Um, what do we wanna do with that? I think that was referred to the planning board, right? Yeah. The endorsement committee was pretty much the Route 130 in conjunction with economic development. But there was a portion. I don't, do we, it's not in this packet, is it? No, it's a, a portion that says that a representative from the, um, from the manager's office. All right, so has so that been, have that open. has that been, so who's, who changes that? Who, I'm not sure. That's why I'm bringing it. Yeah, it was. It, I think it was, it was stated in the minutes as to what, you know, what the criteria was for the board. Right. I think the criteria was there, but okay, there needs to be an appointment from the manager's office. That's what's open on that that plan endorsement. Okay. So then we can just get that shifted tomorrow. Then. You want me to resend the or send the plan endorsement back out to council? The resolution. So you can appoint me or my designee. Right. <laughs> and then we'll we'll get a covered. Right. I think it just needs to be it just needs to be listed on the so you're saying it needs to be listed on the resolution, right? Right. All right. So we can just just change that. Okay, so just add that. Yeah, because it's in a, and it's in accordance with the men um what was said 
Yes. At and that meeting. Okay. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. Um, I see boards and commissions on here, but I don't have a list of people who I've put in. It should have been one, there be one um, citizen leadership form. There was one for environmental commission. Okay, you wanna make a motion? Yes, I make a motion to nominate uh, Steve Silverstein to the environmental commission. Second. All right. Moved by Councilwoman, I mean Deputy Mayor Whitfield, seconded by Councilman, Councilman Anderson. Anderson. Roll call. Councilman Anderson? Yes. Councilwoman Perron? Yes. Councilwoman Worthy? Yes. Deputy Mayor Whitfield? Yes. And Mayor McIntyre? Yes. Okay. And we already approved that resolution. Yes. In the consent agenda. Got it. All right. And I wanted to bring up um, Councilman Perone. I know you brought up the PEX card. Um, you presented information mm -hmm. to the council um, concerning that. And I there was a reply from uh, the township manager. Would that suffice or do you want to go um, through it? Well, I didn't see the reply, but it's up to the council if you want to, if it's something that you think would be helpful. I thought it would be helpful um, as long as there aren't anything, there isn't anything that legally prevents us. Does your response have anything that includes that legally binds us from not using a PEX card? Yes, it does. So the, the PEX card is, is actually a good implementation, mm -hmm. but not just for local government um, because the rules of local government uh, established by local finance notices and the New Jersey statutes have certain requirements, one of them being that um, the card would have to have some type of interface with our accounting software. They don't have interface with, with Edmunds accounting software, nor our banking. Um, for us to utilize a P card when the local unit would contract with an issuer, um, they have to be a financial institution chartered by a staple state or federal authority. I don't know that that organization that sponsors that card is actually chartered by a state or federal authority. One of the other requirements that P card systems neither need to be contracted with the bank through an agreement that gets negotiated at the time of choosing the banking institution or through a cooperative purchasing agreement, either with the New Jersey De Treasury Department or another legally operating purchasing co-op, which this particular organization is not, or by way of some type of competitive contracting process. So we would have to go out to bid to receive quotes to have these P cards. So I don't think that this particular PEX card is really applicable for local government use, although for the corporate private sector, it would be a, a great addition. So you, when you say you don't think it can be used for local government, can you find out if it can or not? So we have a more definitive, because I, I heard you say, and thank you for looking at it, but um, I heard you say that um, basically in summary, there are a few different areas that still need to be looked into to see if, if it works for the council, because that's more so what I was looking for. It. Well, yes, um, unless the council is just not interested, but it seems like we just want to know, I think they want to know more about whether or not we can use it. That's what I want to know as far as. Well, essentially, I was I was laying out that you, you, you couldn't use it. We can't use that. Right, because it does not meet the requirements of the local finance notices and the state statutes. Okay. Great for private corporation, but not for local government. Mm -hmm. Did you take a look at that, Mr. Crook? I've looked at the procurement end of it, and I agree. And in terms of the requirements, in terms of their credentials and dealing with banking, uh, the manager is correct in regard to that, too. So, I, I again, I think it's a great idea for private sector, but I we just, to make it fit for us just won't work because mm -hmm. of the federal and state requirements that have to apply to it. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to look at um, a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of meetings ago, 
Um, we did have a resident just indicate um, that there were issues with uh, some landlords really raising the rates um, to our seniors and veterans, um, raising the rates of rental properties and the rent um, in an enormous increments. Um, so the council did decide to just look into what we could do in terms of, um, I'm gonna say housing affordability, maybe something to do with rent control, but we understand rent control um, typically deals with multi-dwellings and not single housing units, um, but it is becoming a, a huge issue in Willingboro um, as investors are buying up a lot of the properties. It is pushing a lot of our um, vulnerable population out. Um, so we did as a township at least want to investigate and address it. So Mr. Crook did do some research and we have an update, um, but there will still be more work being done to just see what we can do. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Ms. Mayor. Um, essentially what my research has found is that it's a unique in New Jersey, which is a lot of times municipalities authority and powers come from a state legislative statute. However, there is no such statewide statute in the state of New Jersey. They do, however, and that the law has been established via case law, that it's within the municipality's powers to create rent stabilization or rent control ordinances. Uh, essentially, I did, I did kind of a survey and looked at the various types of ordinances that are out there. Um, and they range from applying to single family homes, which is rare, most of them don't. <clears throat> most of them apply to multi-resident type of situations. There's some restrictions, which I'll talk about in a moment as to what you can apply, even in terms of multi-resident. But at the end of the day, I guess in terms of the inquiry, the standard type of rent control ordinances that are in place, and they range from towns like Atlantic City, Camden, you know, Newark, East Orange, West Orange. Uh, there's different types of how they apply it, but the there's a couple, three different types of examples that I found prevalent, which is holding the amount of the rate increase to be equivalent to no greater than the consumer price index, which if you look at today's market because of the economy, consumer price index is up six, 7%. Um, there's other ordinances where it just locks it into a straight percentage. Uh, for example, in Bergen County, Camden uh, City, East Orange, uh, Bergen's, they lock it in at 4%. Camden lock it in no greater than 5%. East Rutherford is 5%. East Windsor is 2.9%. I, I gave you a listing in the memo. I'm not going to go through all of them. But you really look at there's a CPI tied model. There's a tie to a, just a straight percentage where the rental increases can't exceed a certain percentage. And then ultimately, there's kind of a combination of both, which you apply the CPI, but if the CPI goes above a certain percentage, then the percentage applies. So there, there's examples where in, in Newark, it's basically CPI, but if CPI goes up to 7%, the, the, the increase still can't go past 4%. So that's kind of a hybrid way of approaching it. So there's various approaches to how you do it in terms of locking in the actual allowable amount of increases. The types of dwellings, I think the factors that council needs to consider is, you know, based on the demographics of the, the, the town, uh, you have a lot of single family homes, uh, you have multi-unit individuals. So you have to make a decision, are you going to apply it to single family homes, which you can. What, what types of multi-unit dwellings are you allowed to apply it to? There are exceptions in the statutes and ordinances that I, or the ordinance I looked at, which for example, if it's a multi-unit of anywhere from two to four units where the owner occupies one of the units, that's an exemption that wouldn't apply to that. Um, there's also exceptions for anything, any new buildings that have been built for multi-unit dwellings like apartments, et cetera that have been constructed within the last 30 years where they don't allow rent control to apply to that. The rationale is basically you want to encourage the, the landlords and the, and the investors to build new, newer units, that which of course are updated and, and provide better quality units for the, the renters. So you have to make decisions. And I think ultimately council would have to consider 
are you going to apply it to single family homes? Are you going to apply it to multi-unit? Um, are you going to have an exception for owner-occupied properties? Um, you have no choice but to comply with the restriction for the new units for multi-dwellings that are 30 years. That's actually a statute. So that would have to apply. Assuming you would want to go ahead with a rent stabilization ordinance, uh, all the ordinances that I've looked at have, they create what's called a rent control or rent stabilization board, which uh, ranges anywhere from five appointees up to uh, so even nine or greater 11 I've seen. <clears throat> and essentially the function of that board would be to be an administrative entity, which uh, tenant, if they had a situation where they got hit with the 100% increase in rent, could file an application, a complaint with that board. The board would then consider and hear the application. The landlord would have to appear. The tenant would have to appear. Some ordinances actually provide for a designated appointed attorney to be re represent that board in those type of situations. Um, some ordinances actually provide for some sort of legal assistance to tenants that don't obviously have the financial resources to fight a landlord. So there, there are considerations, but you the bottom line is in order to administer the ordinance, you would have to create this board um, and you would have to fund it and fund its operations. And again, they would be responsible for enforcing the ordinance, for holding hearings on the ordinance and ultimately issuing decisions on whether or not the rent increases are consistent with the ordinance that you would adopt. So at the end, I guess the make a long story sh relatively short, if you want to go forward, I need direction as to, you know, what types of dwellings do you want to apply it to? What's the model you would want to use in terms of restricting and creating the limitations for rent increases? And what kind of model are you looking at in terms of creating the rent stabilization board? Now, and in creating that, obviously, there's going to be budgetary impacts because you have to fund it. You have to make sure it's available. Some some cities, it doesn't appear that their boards are that active. Other cities, they're almost, they meet two or three times a month. So the people you appoint to these boards have to be willing to put in the time and effort to be there, to make the hearings. And, you know, it's going to be quite a commitment on their part, or it could be. So that's just a general overview. So, you know, that's kind of thrown out for consideration and discussion by council. And based on your direction, if you want to go ahead, then I take the next step, which is to put together a draft ordinance, and we'd start the process of reviewing the draft ordinance and moving ahead. And Anybody so, have any questions? I'd I just want to make sure. So, to, so to address this concern, uh, I guess like a quasi -ju judicial board would have to. You would have to create formed. the you know the the model. They either call it a rent control board or rent stabilization board. And you would, all, all the ordinances I've seen have created that to provide the proper due process, both for the tenant to have a forum to bring the complaint and for the landlord to respond. And it is like a quasi judicial function that they ultimately, they, they hear, they hold hearings, they take testimony, and they ultimately issue a decision. Um, Madam Mayor, yes. I make a motion that we create um, such of a board. This We can have a second and discuss it. Oh, second, you want to discuss? Yeah, I second. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank both of you for looking into this. And um, I did uh, have a chance to read the email from the person that had um, contacted the council about um, this matter. So as far as what you've described and what I've read, um, I'd like to see the board established. And um, I do think, and I guess more description as far as on the board, but I think you asked on whether or not it would be applicable to single family homes and um, what was the other type of home? <clears throat> multi -dwelling. Well, there's, multi there's single family homes, multi-dwelling and multi-dwelling can range from a unit that's either two, two units in a residence up to four. And there's an exemption if the landlord is actually one of the occupants of one of those units. Okay. Oh, is that similar to like a mother daughter home? That that could be like. That. Oh, okay. All right. I I think it should be for both. Um, that's that's just my thought. I think it should be if we're gonna run stabilize. I think it should be across the board. Yeah. Ma Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I know we're mostly single family. Yes. I don't believe we have the multi dwellings. 
we, the, the apartments and the, well, I mean, I understand the apartments, but the two, like the two family houses and so forth. Duplex. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it includes the hotels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I've, and people have done different things to their properties. And I just think just to include it this way is there. Yeah. It doesn't exist, you know, um, no, and I agree. And I think just the biggest hurdle from everything that's come in that I've seen has been the single family because the multi dwellings I've seen where that was a little easier to maneuver. Mm -hmm. um, the single family is where it's kind of getting a little seemingly convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, and this is being just so everyone knows this is being talked on this um, with assembly and state and all of that like that's considering because it's, it's becoming a bigger issue, not just in Willingboro. <clears throat> Um, even federally is being discussed. Um, the big cities don't have the same issue. They have their rent control for the multi-dwellings and stuff like that um, and duplexes. But um, Willingboro is, you know, a little bit uh, different with our single family, single family population. Um, and it is attacking us at this point. Um, we're here to protect our residents. So um, I'm willing to go forward. It seems like a, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous. It seems like a heavy task but I'm willing to at least um, continue going down that path as we all talk to, you know, our state legislation, um, national legislation um, to bring this problem, um, this issue, you know, so that they can legislate, legislate also, because I see, it seemed like we're kind of tied from the municipal aspects, but I'm willing to invest the time and um, some resources to trying to prevent it. Yeah. You know? Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think this is an important issue. Um, and I am interested in moving forward, though I don't think we should do so lightly. Um, I think, you know, especially because it has budget implications, um, we need to form a board. I think we need to understand and lay out um, what the expectations are for the members of that board um, so that folks know what they're getting into. I think there's a significant amount of work that needs to go into this before we, you know, just say, yeah, complete, <laughs> form the board and let's, let's bulldoze through. Um, so if, I don't know which entity it will go to, whether it will be the clerk or the manager to um, see what the budgetary um, requirements would be to form an additional board and um, host hearings and things of that sort. There are all sorts of ancillary and auxiliary uh, costs that'll go into that. Well, Madam Mayor. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to respond to uh, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Whitfield. Um, so the motion is to form the board. So whatever that entails underneath that umbrella, that's when we would look into the budgetaries and all of its apples and oranges to put it together. Um, so that's just wanted to clear that up. That's the motion that's on the floor. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I do support going forward. Um, I would be curious if when we look at the formation of the board, would it be possible to identify different designees from different areas similar to how we do some of the other boards? Perhaps there's someone from inspections, someone from, um, I don't know, the manager's office, maybe even from the school district, the MUA, you know, having people with different perspectives. And then of course, you know, um, tenants or landlords or, but just some kind of um, identification of the source of where the board members are coming from to help to make sure we have a broad perspective as we go forward, but I do support it. I also would be uh, curious if, um, Mr. Crook, if you could share perhaps where I could find how much these boards budgets look like for a town that's like similarly situated to Willingboro, what the budget May possibly. Well, I think what I would, if we're going to go forward, what I would do is I'd work with the township manager. And I think, you know, some towns might be very cooperative and being willing to share that information with us. Others might want us to do OPA requests, <laughs> but I'm sure we can obtain the information and use that to kind of figure out what is the cost. That, I mean, the difficulty is finding a town that's actually comparable to Willingboro. Right. Uh, because a lot of the towns that have it are the big cities, et cetera, which, of course, have huge budgets and unlimited money, or at least more money than, than we might have. Okay. But I, I would work with the township manager to kind of put together and do some information, prepare kind of a summary 
of what we anticipate the cost would be. <clears throat> and in terms of your other point, the there are some of the ordinances actually have qualifications that provide for you know representatives of tenant organizations, representative like church organizations, nonprofits. So kind of you can you can work that into your ordinance as to what members can be qualified so you have a proper representation of the entire community. On okay, the board. I appreciate that because we do have a homeowners association mm -hmm. in Willingboro and we would probably want them on there. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the work being done. Um, I agree with my colleagues that um, it does need a comprehensive look as we get ready. And and um, thank you for making the motion, Councilwoman Perone. At the same time, I don't want it to be something that takes a year to do. So I think, you know, it is going to be comprehensive, but I'm hopeful because of the issue, we're able to do that work um, comprehensively, but also with um, with some speed too. Thank Understood. you. <laughs> Anything else? So we're going to go forward. So there's a we, motion we need. Yeah, we had a we second. Motion. So now I guess yeah, we roll call, do a roll, roll call. Yeah. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 And in, in the next, um, within the next month, the next couple of council meetings, um, we will be um, circling back to the group home conversation also. Is there anything else for unfinished business? Okay, moving on to new business. Does any council member have anything for new business? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to public comment. Public comment is now open. You have four minutes. Please state your name and address for the record. Is it working this time? Okay, Pat Lindsay Harvey, um, Happy Lane. I'm really happy to hear that we have three new businesses come to town, but I'm extremely happy that 911 Spoke House is coming because now I don't have to drive over to Trenton to go there anymore. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I think we need to toot our own horn about the fact that our community is very safe and that crime is going down. I think a lot of people don't know that. It'd probably be a good thing to give to all, to real, all the realtors uh let's see three um i read today that officially there were nine tornadoes that touched down in new jersey nine tornadoes one was a little bit too close for comfort in delran on uh, cinnamons area and i would venture to say that most of our residents don't know what to do in case of a tornado so it might be a really good idea to put some information um on the website to tell people what they should do um in case of a tornado um, uh, the Willingboro Community Development Corporation, this is just two events that we have coming up on Friday. We have our Fresh Friday, and this one's going to be kind of dedicated for people with, with uh, pets, dogs, and cats. And we're going to be giving away free dog tags. That's not this, I'm not, I'm sorry, not this Friday. It is the 12th because this Friday is um, Good Friday, so we're not having it this Friday. And then on um, April 27th at the Kennedy Center, we're going to have an entrepreneur and career symposium. So if you know people who are interested in going into business or changing your career to an up and coming future um, um, industry, we are having our keynote speaker is Jane Oates. She is the president of Working Nations out of Boston. And she also was the assistant um, secretary under the Department of Labor in the Obama administration. And that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Host, can we allow those on Zoom? Uh, yes, Mayor. Maddie Mallory. Good evening, Maddie Mallory, Hudson Place. And uh, I'll start on a positive note. I uh, actually had uh, the street sweeper on my street um, yesterday again. So uh, I appreciate that, even though our street is relatively clean, uh, I'll take it. Um, the other thing is a public service announcement. Uh, Friends of the Willingboro Public Library, uh, we're having our spring book sale on April the 29th 
and it starts at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's a $5 books uh, bag sale and the bags will be supplied. So look for flyers around town. I think uh, we got permission to even put some in the municipal building. So uh, we would appreciate um, participation from the community because everything we, all the funds we raise, of course, support library programs. Uh, now moving along to some other things. Um, I think one of the things that we need to look at to look at is um, we have quite a few tree shade mechanics. And for those of you who are not familiar with tree shade mechanics, growing up in the South, if you needed your car repaired and the mechanic did not have a shop to work in, they would work on your car under the shade of the tree. So basically that's what we call a tree shade mechanic. And I've noticed that we have quite a few around town. And um, I think, um, you know, we need to try and identify these individuals who are working on cars in their driveways or actually on the street. Um, the other thing is I asked for a copy of the budget. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, treasurer's report. And a couple of things, it's a large report, but a couple of things caught my attention. One is um, in the section called the check payment batch. Um, it appears that even the Kennedy Center is not convinced that our water is uh, safe to drink because for the month of March, it appears that $424.91 was spent for water at the Kennedy Center. So, you know, just throwing that out there. Um, the other thing on the uh, bill list on page eight, uh, there's something that caught my attention. And if I could get an explanation as to what that refers to, I would be uh, happy about that. And let me just tell you what it is so I can hurry up and get my time in here. But at the top of uh, page eight, uh, on the bill list, it says that the township clerk contractual, uh, an amount of 10,946.07. Uh, if I could get an explanation as to what that uh, relates to, I would be uh, happy about that. And I think that's all that I have for this evening. So have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Nye. Before you go, um, today was the spring book sale. I'm sorry? Today was the spring. What day was the spring book sale again? Uh, the book sale is April the 29th. Okay. And it starts at 10 a.m. and it goes until 4 p.m. and it's a $5 bag and we will provide the bags. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Sharon Anderson. Good evening again, folks. This is Sharon Anderson. I'm calling from 7 Bellhurst Lane. I speak here publicly to thank two Willingboro businesses uh, for welcoming the teachers at the Life Center Academy on nearly no notice. <laughs> Last week, overnight, Burrow Pet Project got together with Vincenzo's Pizza and Grill and Supreme Desserts to uh, provide nourishment for the teachers as they were preparing their rooms. Um, I, I really appreciate how both Vincenzo's and Supreme Desserts stepped up. And if anybody's tasted Supreme Desserts banana pudding, you will know why. Um, I want to point out that we have families driving to a bookbinder every day now, and they create a terrific market opportunity for all businesses in Willingboro. Um, the principal, Tracy Casabone, is very welcome to outreach ideas, and she and the guidance counselor, Tammy Nowicki, were both raised in Willingboro. So I encourage businesses to consider, out, hand, consider handing out samples, okay, yes, I'll be in line too, um, or coupons to this nearly captive market. 
Um, also, I thank Pat Lindsay Harvey for mentioning the HANDS event, Fresh Friday. That is April 14th, Friday, 6 p.m., Brighto Park. Um, one of the primary purposes for Borough Pet Project is to reduce the number of lost dogs who endure being taken to the shelter and families who spend sleepless nights wondering where their four-legged uh, member might be. One of the simplest and most effective ways to reunite with your lost dog is by having a dog collar. In the 10 years I have been helping dogs in Willingboro, I kid you not, not one dog had a dog tag with their owner's name and number. So um, I'm very grateful for Full House Pets from Mount Laurel. They're going to bring their engraving machine and we're going to have dog tags for free. So I really encourage dog owners to come and get dog tags so that uh, people who find your lost dog can call you right away and they don't have to be in the shelter overnight. And we'll see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. All right, John Manuel. Good evening, John Manuel, Iberlane. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening to the council. I'm actually calling to um, say great job to the council. Uh, you guys have done an amazing job since the last time I've called and complained, which was a lot. And I really just wanted to highlight a lot of the great things that you guys are doing, publicizing uh, on the website, the Willenboro Connect. Um, I don't know if Sharon Anderson know, but the Willenboro Council was up at Life Center. Um, and shout out to y'all for that. Shout out to the Willenboro Police Department. Great job to the township ma uh, manager. Um, I've been highly critical in the past of mistakes, and we need to be vocal when you guys are doing an amazing job. And I really want to say thank you. Um, the Willenboro Connect app is really great and functional. You guys are doing a great job with the seniors up there. Um, and the woman in charge of communication, like public affairs, she's really good at on Facebook. I love what she's doing. So continue the great work. Uh, you need to hear that. Great job to everybody sitting up there. Great job to uh, specifically the township manager. I think you're doing a really good job. I love how you're engaging. It looks like it from the outside. Um, I wanted to shout out Dennis Tunstall, was very critical of the of our inspections people, and uh, they have done a great job. Please do not waste time on people fixing cars. We don't have time for that right now. I know the other woman said that. Sorry. No, we don't have time for that. Like, we got, we got to keep bringing our community together. Um, the police have done an amazing job. Yes, they lower crime. Like, great job. We got to really highlight these great things. And I love how the um, Sharon said that uh, the woman came from Willenbrook. Yes, because Willenbrook creates great people. We are a great environment. So we need to publicize. She did say some really good. Our businesses should go up there and they should welcome them um, and maybe give out some free stuff. But again, I just wanted to say great job to everyone. Um, really happy to be a part of our community. The streets are clean. My trash is getting picked up. Um, great job. Oh, it's going to kill me to say this one. Good job uh, to uh, Rich Verbogel. Um, oh, that hurt. Uh, Public Works has been cleaning up. They they did a great job on uh, after the storm. <sighs> Damn, that hurt. But great job, Rich, on that. Um, you know, you gotta give you gotta give honor where it's due. So I really think you did a great job and doing a great job in there. But thank you to the council and let's keep up the great work. Have a good day. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Manuel. <laughs> All right, Beulah Williams. Good evening, Mayor McIntosh, Deputy Mayor, and everyone. Um, I have <laughs> Beulah Williams from Eight Botany Circle. I agree that our township council mayor and everyone are doing an awesome job. And um, 
kudos to our manager. I've always said that you all are doing a good job, good job. And we appreciate you. Um, two things though. Uh, number one, I appreciate the warning about the tor tornado watch, but we weren't um, instructed as what to do, where to go. And so that's lacking information. Maybe you could bone up on that. And then something that's very troubling is the potholes. There are too many potholes in Willingboro. There are too many. So can that be addressed? Please, please. Deep potholes, too many of them. And thank you so very much for the good work. May God continue to bless not just you, but your families and the Willingboro community. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. You're welcome, Mayor. Host, is there anyone else on Zoom for public comment? Hey, um, not at this time, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Yes, William Weston, 44 Basel Flame. Uh, I did have some questions previously, and they, I, I wanted to get a number on the pre prescription drugs uh, interactions, or I guess the, the arrests. Uh, and also, even though we don't have a lot of interactions with, uh, in, I mean, excuse me, there's not a lot of interactions, uh, is there any training to make sure they don't escalate or make sure that we don't have any kind of nationwide incident? And those were my questions. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Cicely. Um, I'm a new resident over in the Garfield area and it's nice meeting you all. I'm glad I'm moving here today. Um, I wanna be involved in this community coming from Staten Island, New York. Um, I noticed something, I stepped out to the public library. I don't know if you guys know of what's going on over there, but the homeless is actually taking over over there. It was very alarming when I stepped out of my car. I actually stepped back, I'm like, What's going on over here? Um, there's two shopping carts filled with all sorts of everything, alcohol bottles. And then I entered the library and I actually saw a few people loitering, sprawled out over the desk, sleep. Um, I just don't feel that it's a safe environment for the community. I don't feel that it's a safe environment for children. I don't know if you guys into public space like that. And I did um, address the director wasn't there, but the assistant director was there. I did address my concerns and she said she has been talking to you guys. She also stated that you guys stated that y'all would be sending patrols to come over there, but I have been over there for a few days and I haven't seen anyone come in. I don't feel safe, as I said again, um, just for the public sanitary of the people. Um, I think that we can do something about it. And also I wanted to know what do the township have in place to help out the homelessness. Um, I think there should be some type of outreach over there. Um, it was just my first interaction of knowing Willingboro cause I live here, but I can tell you, I know nothing about down here. I work in New York. I just go to work, come home, go to work, come home, go to supermarket. So I don't know anything, but it was very, very alarming because coming from a big city like New York, Staten Island, from Brooklyn, I've never even seen anything like that. So I was just like, wait, what is going on? And she said that um, funds are being cut for the public library. I want us not to forget about the public library, no matter what place we are in our lives, everybody have children and you don't grant children, nieces and nephews, that's the foundation for children, I believe. So we can look into that or y'all can tell me what's going on. Another thing is um, the water down here. I'm just piggybacking off of this. Someone told me that it was addressed two weeks ago. I'm sorry, it's very alarming since I got down here to Willingboro about the water, even though I do use spring water. But in the notice, it said that even boiling the water is not helpful. Helpful. So what is going on with the water down here? Can someone please help me out to let me know what is going on and what is in place? Because not everyone is able to buy bottled water. And as y'all know, the water is expensive. Sometimes it's on sale, sometimes it's not on sale, but 
you know, we use water with everything that we do. And we want to make sure that we're safe and we're healthy and the children are healthy. So can I please, you know, what's going on? Hi, and I thank all of you guys. I hear all of the great comments. I don't know what's going on here, but I want to be involved. So thank you guys for your service. Good evening, Gary Johnson, 54 Gramercy Lane. Um, tonight I want to talk about something we all know about. There's been another shooting at a school. This insanity goes on and on. But one thing that I've read about this particular incident that called my attention, of course, first, the very commendable action of the police force that didn't hesitate to go in, locate, and neutralize the shooter, which obviously brought that nonsense to an end. But another thing caught my attention was that apparently this school was extremely well trained. The head of the school was a great believer in training and the teachers had been trained to know exactly what to do to barricade the doors of their classrooms, uh, cover windows, uh, lock doors, of course, and where to place students for maximum safety. They even went so far as to haul a gadget that they called a, a bullet trap to let teachers actually hear real guns firing real ammunition. And it was said after the, the incident that the teachers were saying, after the first couple of shots, they knew what they were in for because they'd heard it before. But they went still further in this training because in the walkthrough afterwards, they had found that teachers under all the pressure that comes from something like that, had the wherewithal to place medical kits out on desks, including budding, blood control kits out ready for use. And that's the part I come here tonight because obviously the first people on location at something like that is not gonna be the police. It's not gonna be the EMTs, it's gonna be the teachers. And the more ready they are, the more school they are in first aid, the better prepared they are. They can assist students and maybe save one's life by administering first aid right there. Which brings me to the issue tonight. We've talked about cooperation between the township and the school district. And my suggestion or proposal is that could the township go to the school district and offer first aid training for teachers and staff? Uh, it should be a great benefit to not only the community because the more people are trained in first aid, the, the better. Uh, it's just a thought. It, I would like to know that every uh, teacher in our district has been trained in first aid and bleeding control. It's vital items in an emergency, and I would like to see that proposed. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Shirley Dilworn, Newport Lane. I too would like to congratulate the manager and the council and uh, all of the leaders in town for the wonderful job that they're doing. I feel uh, very blessed, you know, to live here and to see all of the good things that you're doing. I'm especially interested in economic development. So I am really excited about the, you know, the two new businesses that will be coming to our town. I'm a little disappointed that I have not seen a street sweeper on my street. <laughs> uh, and I, I've heard that at least one resident says that, you know, the street sweeper has been on her street twice. 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 You said so it twice. I'm really looking forward to that. You know, having a street sweeper, you know, come to uh, my street and my neighborhood. And I'm excited about the Clean Communities Campaign. I encourage all of the residents, all of us, you know, to come out and to support that. I have been talking about clean communities in Bloomberg for a long time. And so finally, we have a campaign that is underway. My question about the clean communities campaign is, where do the youth, school-age students, you know, fit into this overall campaign? I think it would be a wonderful teaching and learning tool, you know, to get them involved. Uh, they are not the only ones, but they are big contributors. 
okay to uh, the trash that we see on the ground. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Dilworth. Which street is that again? Newport. Newport. Can we get Newport, please? <laughs> street sweeper for Newport. Thank you. Message received. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have another one on Zoom. Uh, yes, Tarina Williams. Thank you. Serena Williams, 8 Botany Circle. Good evening, Mayor McIntosh, Deputy Mayor Whitfield, Council members and community. I want to say thank you for a wonderful council meeting. I really appreciate that each council meeting there's a, a proclamation for different awareness months. So we're all encouraged to learn more about autism and Parkinson's disease. Um, in addition to those April is also National Volunteer Month. In fact, there's a National Volunteer Week from the 16th through the 23rd. You may or may not know this, but Sunday, April 16th is Good Deeds Day. So if we don't already have plans to do something good on that day, what better time to do so to start out our week than on Sunday? Um, if there are any um, plans by the township, it'd be really great to... Um, put them on Willing Borrow Connect, which is an awesome app. I really appreciate um, the creators of this awesome app that is a good icebreaker. When someone says, I'm new to the community, the first thing I tell them, welcome to the community, and I show them the app. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Um, when the Mr. Johnson brought up, brought up school shooting, it came to mind that I saw on the news this evening that they found a suicide note at the at the shooters at the shooters home and it's, it's just crazy but um maybe something to consider in the future with may being mental health month maybe different um um institutions and the township themselves could have a, could have a town hall maybe ask congressman kim or other delegates that could come and have a um a town hall about this important subject on suicide and what's really going on in people's minds to do such disturbing acts of violence to such innocent people, young and old. You just never know what people are going through and it would be good to help them to get a grip on things before they get their hands on the wrong things and take people's innocent lives. Um, our church, Willing Bar Seventh-day Adventist Church, when I forgot about that. On May 20th, we'll be hosting a community mental health day on Saturday, May 20th. And then in the afternoon, we'll be having a special workshop featuring different health professionals that will tell about the different resources that they have and have an open panel discussion. So please mark your calendars and make plans to attend. And as always, I'll make a point of sending, oh my. And Haven Township Clerk, Ms. Lijan, a flyer. And as always, I'll greatly appreciate it if she could share it with everyone because we want as many people to benefit from this. Thank you so much for your time and great service. God bless you all and your family. Okay, any, anyone else for public comment? All right, public comment is now closed. All right, Mr. Harris, we'll start with Ms. Um, Lindsay Harvey's. Um, we did have a, um, uh, a, a tornado warning in our area. Um, that does bring up uh, what we want to do, what how we operate for disaster preparedness and resiliency. Um, do we, we have someone in place to... We have a, a very... Um active OEM coordinator yeah. and OEM office. Um, you know, this is something that, that we can discuss. Um, maybe having more defined tornado um, actions um, coordinated for the township and put out for the residents so they do know, uh, you know, how to handle this particular natural disaster. Um, I think tornadoes is not something that historically is really uh, 
present in New Jersey, but it seems like more and more and more mm -hmm. they are making their way. So I think you're absolutely correct as a community. We de do need to educate our residents on how to protect themselves. And we de do need to have protocols and processes in place in case that comes to Willingboro. So we will have those continued discussions with our OEM coordinator, our public safety coordinator, and our different departments to see that, that something gets done in, in that arena. Right, it should, and, and a tornado is one of many one. Um, things that can happen. So, all right, that sounds good. Any other conversations surrounding that? Yeah, some time ago when we had the flash flooding, mm -hmm. we had spoke with Mr. Carroll, OEM, in regards to putting together a document showing residents what to do in case of a flood, in case of different events. So this is a conversation that had started some time ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where it fell off at, but it's very important, like I said, communication. And now that we have the Willingboro Connect app, I mean, what better resource to get it out, that information? Okay. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Miss Mallory. Um, she did indicate that sweep, street sweeper came down her street again. And um, for the tree shade mechanic, is there an ordinance for that? I mean, that's, I think people are allowed to work on their cars. Yeah, I would have to uh, do some research on what our code book says. Okay. And, you know, people do have the ability to to work in their cars, but I don't know if they can have a business. So, right. You know, we would have, right. to, we would have to look at, look at that. Right. Right. And so it'd be more source towards personal cars you're allowed, but there's still some, there's still some um, rules on what you can dispose of and how you can dispose of certain materials. Correct. Okay. Um, I'm not sure with the treasury report, page eight. Yeah, I was kind of looking through that myself and I really couldn't identify um, what she was speaking about in particular. Um, but if Ms. Mallory wishes to give me a call, okay. um, we can can discuss it a little bit further. Okay. I had I was looking, I thought she was referring to, um, did she say the township clerk contractual? Yeah. Um, she made reference to page eight on, yeah. the, on the bill listing, and um, and I don't see anywhere where it says township clerk contractual. It's on the, I'm on page eight. It's on the top. Uh, okay. So this is what I'm looking at. Uh, I don't oh, this is, this is where I got it from. Yeah, this is where I got it from. That's in those right. folks only. Uh, I, don't, page I don't have whatever she's looking at, right. so I can't reference. Well, I can hand you that. Maybe this is this is what I think she's just referring to. It's the only one that has a page eight, and it says township clerk contractual. Do you want me to hand this to you? I'm gonna take a look at it. You can take it with our still. Can you pass this down to him? I'll typically pass it to him. It was in this. So this is, okay, so this looks like this is the a bill for Granicus LLC, mm -hmm. which are which is our website hoster, and they provide other services for the township. So, you know, I just don't, I don't know what this particular invoice is for, but Granicus is our website hoster and provider. Yeah, on the top it says township clerk contractual. I think that's because I heard her vocabulary. She said the township clerk contractual. You see how it's above Granicus? Right, that's the budget line item. Mm -hmm. So it would be a contract that right, is I'm, payable from the township clerk's budgetary line item. Right. So I think that's what she wanted. So you just answered her question. Right. That's what she was asking about. I believe that's what she was asking about. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Pat Lindsay Harvey, I'm going to put you on the, on the spot again as um, our <laughs> as our water commissioner director. India. So and library. Question about the water or what? And Miss Mallory's question. Miss Mallory's oh. question in both. Oh, okay. Yeah. So since you just moved to town, let me just give you a little bit of information. So PFAS, which is a forever chemical, is a national problem, just not a Willingboro problem. A, a number of towns in, in, Willing, in New Jersey <laughs> have had this issue. So New Jersey has what's called a, a limit, which is a number of 15. When our one well 
got above 15, we shut that well off. We were very lucky. Many towns can't do that. So we had one well, we were able to shut it off. No one is getting water from that particular well. When our water was uh, tested again, we are very much under that, that number. So our water is safe. We are building, it's gonna cost $7.4 million to remediate the problem and then put that well back online. Until it's back online, until that's done, that well is not being used. So you, you can drink the water, you can bathe with it, you can cook with it, it's totally safe. Yes. The letter. Yes, okay. So we're in a constant fight with DEP since November of 2021 because the letter is a mandated. We don't have a choice. We have to send the letter. The letter is not, it's a, it's a cookie cutter letter. Every town has to send this letter, even though it has inaccurate information in it. The letter says the whole entire system is contaminated. That's not the fact. The fact that it was one well. We've been, like I said, been fighting with them since November, 2021 to be able to tell the residents what it is. We're not even allowed to contradict them. We have sent them, uh, a letter that we wanted to set out, we were told, no, we're not allowed to do it. So we are in a constant fight and we're gonna continue to fight. It may come down to us telling the residents, listen, you know, write the, write the commissioner, write the governor. It may come down to that. We're in a, in a constant fight. We're having a special meeting tomorrow night on this particular issue. Um, you're welcome to come, it's, a, it's closed session, but we, we meet every third Wednesday uh, via Zoom at six o'clock. You just go on the website and come on, but the water is safe. I drink it. My mother even called, so don't feel bad. My mother called me and says, I can't drink the water. I'm like, here we go. So don't feel bad. You know, everybody's in the same situation. We have to send that letter. We don't have a choice. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Trustee of library. Um, um, okay, so <laughs> yeah, the, the homeless is a very big issue at the library. Uh, we've had them, um, cut their hair in the bathroom. We have had them wash themselves in the bathroom. It is a very big issue. We're trying to figure out how, how we deal with this. Um, we have heard that other towns are dropping their homeless off in Willingboro. Um, so it's an issue. And why we need, you know, we need help because it's a very big issue. Well, for the homelessness also, we are um, speaking to the county because, um, Willembro cannot absorb all of that yeah, responsibility. It's, it's not within our yeah. um, jurisdiction to absorb all of that. Um, the library just happens to be a place where it's easy to congregate, um, and it's 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 a space. And then they can they're, when the library opens, they can go wash up and everything. Um, so we are still working out what role the library plays um, with homelessness. Um, but we still are reaching out to the county and state for some resources um, because we can't accommodate. A lot of them are coming from other municipalities, other towns down Route 130. Um, so um, we are addressing it. And we do have a, a resident who has a nonprofit foundation that's also um, contributing to helping them also. So it's just really getting resources um from Willenboro and the county and the state um so it is being looked at it is being addressed I know it's an eyesore sometimes but um they are people we we are trying to uh, mitigate that circumstance um I go now. Yeah, you, you may be dismissed <laughs> um do you have anything to add for the homelessness so that was a, a conversation that yeah. that we did um entertain during the colder months mm -hmm. and you know the police have been very diligent about you know patrolling those properties and making sure that they aren't encamped there um but you know one of the difficulties is this is public space so they are entitled to go into the library and use mm -hmm. the restroom you know we've had homeless people sleeping in the police station bathroom at, at night so it's not only in the library, it's, it, there are problems everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, we do reach out to them with solutions that they reject. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have increased security uh, at the library. We have put security officers in there. 
to offer um, some some uh, elevated safety. I don't know why they're saying that the the township is cutting the library budget because that's not factually correct. Right. Um, so you know we are we are doing what we can do, and still respect people's civil liberties. Right. So you know it's it's a balance. So you know we will continue to do what we can do, maybe in a, loitering or enforcements, you know things. But you know we're just trying to find that 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 balance. Agreed. And also, I just wanted to circle back for the um, the water safety. Also, um, Miss Lindsay, Miss Lindsay, do you have a comparative? Because even with the state regulation um, for the PFAS, we're still quite lower than the national average, and I think that needs to be explicitly said. Uh, when? Oh, <laughs> well, seventy to four. But I, I mean, I see. Right. So these conversations are happening again on a state and federal level um, because the municipalities are being bombarded um, with with the cost of remedi um, remediating these uh, these issues. However, the, however, um, the municipality did not put those chemicals in the water. It's coming from surrounding manufacturing, surround, surrounding environmental aggressors that aren't being um, penalized. The municipal, municipalities are being penalized. Um, the MUA has done a great job getting in front of, or, or you know, trying to get in front of it. Um, but compared to even other municipalities and other states, we're pretty, New Jersey is pretty low, um, but it is a national crisis. Um, but you know, they say go buy bottled water. Um, there's no guarantee bottled waters, but there's other chemicals in bottled water. There's stuff that leaches out the plastic that goes into water. So, um, it's how you look at it, but I will say that our MUA is doing, um, their due diligence in terms of, um, remediating any of these issues. And they're going to, there's going to be other chemicals that come up that they're going to change, that they're going to, um, make us be aware of also, but the fight also is to hold the manufacturers, hold the chemical companies accountable for the waste that is going into the ground and for the waste that's going into the streams. So that is being fought um, to Ms. Lindsay Harvey's point. Um, the DEP, they don't have a definite clear way uh, that we can stop one well that is a little bit over and that is not being part of our, that is not part of our water system. So, I mean, but, the, and, and I was there on the, some of the meetings with DEP, that, that she, that is the truth. We can, we can't say otherwise, but um, it is being remediated. Um, but I would definitely uh, make sure the public knows, um, compare it to different um, states. Cause I think even New York wasn't as low as New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. So um, it's not a Willingboro thing. It's being pushed and Willingboro seems to be targeted for the media, per, you know, but it's not a Willingboro issue. Um, potholes, Ms. Beulah Williams. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, this is nothing that we are, are shying away from. We are well aware that Willingboro has a lot of potholes. Um, I will tell you that since the beginning of the year, we have uh, remediated over 200 of those potholes and the council was gracious enough at the last meeting to authorize the purchase of a a hot patcher which will allow us to go in and remediate those at an even greater rate and more consistently so it is something that we are working on um you know as i mentioned with the 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 street repairs you know those funds are being put into place we're going to go and uh repave Willingboro's 14 worst roads. So, you know, we are doing what we can to alleviate these problems. I understand that they're there. We are not shying away from them, but they are being addressed. Okay. All right. Um, probably need uh, Captain Bucks for this. Let me, uh, Mr. Westing, this was concerning um, the presentation for Captain, yeah. So the prescription drug numbers and nationwide incidents. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm afraid it's reported 
training. Okay. Yes, the, uh, the prescription you. drug number was uh, was 83 grams. And uh, as far as continued training, yes, all of our officers are trained in ICAT and ABLE. So ICAT is uh, integrated communications and tactics, which was done. All of our officers were certified in that last year. Every six months, there's a refresher course that we go through. And then we also have sent our officers to uh, a course called verbal judo, which is a way it's, it's de-escalation techniques. So uh, it's always a continuous uh, education with our officers and continuous training with our officers. So yes, and I think that was it. Thank you, Captain Box. All right, and we'll circle back. Miss Cicely or Cecily? Miss Cicely? Miss Cicely. Um, well, welcome to Willenboro. Um, we're glad to have you. Um, and I, may, I am excited that you are interested in being involved. Um, if you sign up, I would say the first step is at least sign up um, with our Connect, the Willowboro Connect app. Um, there are plenty of activities that can get you ingrained um, into the community. Um, I think it's a wonderful community, if we should say so ourselves, but it, um, yeah. And then there's there are opportunities for boards and commissions. And we're just gonna, we have to put that out um, to make sure you understand. I don't, I don't have them written down right now. To even go through them. Okay. Yeah. If we get your email address, we can reach out to you. Oh, you got it. Okay. But um, yeah, there's, there'll be plenty of opportunities. The Clean Communities is a big one that's coming up this month. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, the symposium to interact um, with other residents. So, I mean, we are excited to have you. I'm glad you came out. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll, we will see you around. Anything I missed on this one? Okay. <laughs> All right. And then Mr. Johnson, uh, interacting with the school board. Mr. Harris, do you have anything on that for the first aid training? So we actually just had a meeting with the school board on Friday um, where we had a opportunity to discuss some uh, partnership uh, opportunities with the township. Um, uh, as far as shooting situations and things like that, again, that's something that we can discuss with our public safety director and, and talk to the school board. There are things that we can investigate in regards to that. Um, as far as partnerships uh, with the school, once again, uh, you know, our, our, our first state, our EMS, EMS department has gone and, and done stop the bleed training, CPR training in all of our departments, and we would be more than happy to extend those opportunities out to the, the school board. So as we continue our discussions with them, you know, we will continue to foster these opportunities where our resources can merge with their resources and both entities are mutually benefited. Agreed. Okay. And then for Ms. Dilworth. Ms. Dilworth, uh, the economic development update, I think I have to agree with Ms. Dilworth. Um, Mr. Harris, that was a good update. Um, if we can get those consistently, you know, um, the council is working also to bring further economic development into this um, town, um, especially on Route 130. Uh, so we are diligently working. We're just, it's a little slow, but we are we are moving. And also with the youth involvement, um, some of our council members have been talking to the schools um, and trying to make sure um, we're, we are creating the one Willingboro that with the Willingboro schools, the Willingboro MUA and the township. Um, they are the superintendent has committed to making sure that there are students. Um, attending the clean communities um, and making sure they're aware, making sure that parents are aware, because um, I think it is a very important initiative. <clears throat> Um, but the schools have been informed and there has been commitment from their um, interim superintendent to really push that information and encourage um, the youth to get involved as part of their civic duty. So that is happening. And lastly, Ms. Williams, um, Ms. Blasian, can we just make sure we have nat the National Volunteer a Proclamation or an awareness um, for next meeting? And I didn't have anything, any notes. Anybody have any notes from Ms. Williams? 
We appreciate all the compliments and all the kudos um, to our staff and their team and the council township manager. Um, we do appreciate it. I know, you know, we, we get a lot of complaints and we'll take the complaints, but we do um, really appreciate um, the acknowledgments of the work that we are doing. So we do appreciate everyone who did call in um, and acknowledge that. And now we will move on to council comments. Does any council have any comments for tonight? Councilman Carl. Um, thank you. So first I want to just make sure that it's very clear that we did not have a school shooting here because there was a few comments mentioning in this meeting. So those who are jumping on later, um, if you, you know, when you come to the public comments, just please state wherever it was. We don't want to cause um, any confusion, but it's a good idea to prepare, you know, just in case. I wanted to get that out there. Um, I don't have very much this evening. I just want to thank you all for your comments and your suggestions. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Perot. Dr. Worthy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a few uh, comments. Um, thank you to the warm welcome from the community to Life Center Academy Monday. Um, thank you to the administration, Mr. Lowry, and everyone who brought out the, the press. We had Fox News here, y'all. Um, we had Fox and we had uh, CBS and some others uh, that came out, which was really great. Shout out to Borough TV, who did a really nice um, update uh, about LCA coming to Willingboro. I appreciate that. Um, congratulations to our very own Councilwoman Perone for becoming one of the newest members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. So congratulations. We see you all over the networks and everything. So wonderful. Um, congratulations to you. Um, I did want to ask Mr. Harris if we could consider a upgrade to the microphone that's here. I know that the audience has a hard time um, hearing from that microphone and we can't tell that they can't hear because it it's loud for us, but it's not um, working properly for the audience. So since we're going to be back in session, um, hopefully we'll stay in person. Um, I'd like to see that addressed, please. And then finally, um, uh, have Ramadan Mubarak. We've got Happy Easter, Happy Resurrection Day, Kosher and Joyous Passover. Uh, to everyone who is celebrating all of the um, these wonderful holidays during this season, just want to wish everyone well and season's greetings. And if you're not celebrating at all, then congratulations and celebrating that too. So <laughs> just want to make sure I recognize everybody. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you to my council colleagues um, for such a productive discussion during this meeting and appreciate the work of the administration um, for us to be able to have a productive meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Worthy. I just want to thank everyone for coming out. Thank Captain Bucks for the presentation. Very informative. I want to thank my buddy over here, Mr. Harris. Sharon. You know, job well done. You know, the great comments coming in speaks to the work that's being done. And just to let everybody know, we can do a council meeting in three hours. Have a good evening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just a few things from me. Um, I also want to say uh, welcome to the community, to Life Center Academy. It was an awesome celebration and um, welcoming to them. Um, into Willingboro yesterday morning. So thank you to the, um, everyone that came out and everyone in Willingboro for showing up to welcome the students and um, staff of Life Center and wishing them a, a safe and um, well west of the school year. Um, also, um, as Mr. Harris said, we did have a meeting with that school with the school board. I think it was a very productive conversation and ways that we can work together and be better partners to each other as we um, endeavor to be a one willing borough. So um, we are looking forward to building and strengthening that relationship as well. Um, I appreciate, again, the police stats and reports. As I said before, it's so important to um, increase transparency with the community um, as we look to provide a safe community for everyone, not just for a portion of the population. So thank you to Captain Bucks and all of the officers um, in the police department that keep us safe. And in regards to training, I want to know the next time you have that verbal judo class because I would like to attend. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and then also, um, lastly, I just want to encourage everyone to say a prayer or send positive energy out for our nation. There's been a number of things that are going on um, across the country and locally, national um, natural disasters, school shootings, hate crimes, bullying in, in Mount Holly that led a student to take their life. Um, my heart is heavy with everything that's going on. So please, um, you know, continue to keep our community and our nation in prayer as we move forward um, to finish out this year. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I'll just close out by saying thank you for joining me on this beautiful, it was a beautiful spring day, taking a time out um, to come in and participate in the council meetings. Um, I will say be on the lookout in the next couple of weeks for the beautification of <laughs> Van, wait, Beverly Rancocas and Veterans Parkway. Um, that's been one of the big, be below taxes, that's been one of the, the second, uh, the, the, the second request from our residents is to make sure these plants are planted. So be on the lookout in the next couple of weeks for that. Um, but as as uh, Deputy Mayor said, um, just continue to love on each other, love one another. Um, we know we don't know what people are going through, and we are coming on hard times. Um, and as a community, um, let's just continue to support one another and and look out, be you know good neighbors. But have a great night, and we will see you at the Kennedy Center in the next couple of weeks. The next council meeting is at the Kennedy Center. Thank you. Have a good night. Madam Clerk, need a motion, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Anderson, seconded by Dr. Worthy. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.